The Sunday before Murder Music dropped, one of Havoc's homies from Queensbridge, Fakie, came home from doing nine years for shooting at some cops. I went to Freeport to visit Hav, and Fakie was sitting in the kitchen looking happy to be home, being real cool and humble. I didn't know Fakie very well. He was Havoc's boy. I met him once or twice when I first came to Queensbridge, but he got locked up right after that. I told Fakie we were having an album release party at the tunnel the following Sunday, and that I'd give him 12 VIP passes. Sunday rolled around, and I called Fakie to meet in the early evening on 21st Street in Queensbridge so I can give him the passes. Fakie pulled up in a white limousine with a gang of people called Mega, Ice, Spank, Nut, and a bunch of others. I gave him 12 passes and told him to arrive early because the passes were only good until 11 p.m. He agreed, and then I jetted to Alchemist's crib to meet Havoc and the crew. Club security tried to rush us into the tunnel after midnight because the cops were shutting the doors down. You got a bunch of people at the side door trying to get in. They say they with you, one of the security guards told me. How many people? I asked. Twelve. It was Fakie and his crew. I told the security that they had VIP passes. Two cops walked up. All right, we're closing the doors for good. You people are either going in or out. Make up your mind. I tried my best to talk to the cops and let them know this was our party, but they started getting pussy. Either go in or you're staying out. Fuck them niggas, P. We got to do this show. Havoc yelled, heading through the door. Let's go. I told Havoc to wait a minute. I didn't want to leave faking his boys outside without at least trying to help them get in. Can I leave one of my boys here with you to point them out so they can get in? I asked the club security. Please, man. They belong inside with us. They all have passes. He looked at me like he wanted to help. Those passes are only good until 11 p.m. It's almost 1 o'clock, he said. Then pause. Okay, leave one of your boys with me. I'll see what I can do. I left golf over at the door with him and went inside. The club was jam-packed. When we hit the stage to perform, the crowd went crazy. Our first time performing in the tunnel, after all those years of hanging out there. My Benz was parked outside the front door. And as soon as we stepped outside after popping bottles in the VIP, I saw Fakie and his crew looking disappointed because they couldn't get in. Fakie walked up to me, and the police told me to move my car. Go meet me around the block so we could talk, I told Fakie. Around the corner, we get out the rides to talk on the sidewalk. Fakie told me that Ice's car was stolen while they were trying to get in, and Ice wanted me to pay for it. <laughs> tell Ice to get out the car and tell me that himself, I said. Fakie got Ice. I knew Ice way better than I knew Fakie from partying together in the tunnel for years while Fakie was locked up. Ice had a dumbass look on his face when he walked up, like he knew he was about to tell me some bullshit. And he also knew that I wasn't going to go for it. My car is missing. I don't know if it got stolen or towed, he said. That's not my problem, I said. I'm not paying for it. Forget about it, P. It's not your fault, I said, and got back in the car. Don't even worry about it. Niggas just mad because they couldn't get in, Fakie said. I tried to convince them to let y'all in, but y'all came too late. I told you the passage was only good till 11. I said, at least you tried, he said. We really mad at Havoc because we grew up with him and it seemed like he didn't give a fuck about us. While Fakie was speaking, somebody got out the car to take a piss on the corner. I couldn't see who it was from where I was standing. Engaged in the conversation, I didn't take notice as a kid snuck around some cars, moving toward me, snuffing me in my nose. I dropped to the ground unaware of who or what hit me. As I was getting up, I saw it was a little dirty nigga worm. He lifted the chain off my neck while I was still in the daze, and he ran to get back inside the car. Yo, what the fuck is you doing? Fakie screamed, as if confused, but right away I suspected these niggas set me up. Why would they have worm with them when they're fully aware of all the situations with him and Mob Deep? 
They want to set me up. I'm the one who gave them 12 passes. Havoc always told me, stop hanging out on QB. Don't trust them niggas. But it's not my style to cut everybody off because of a few bad apples in the bunch. I was one of the only niggas in Queensbridge actively shooting videos, movies, showing love to the up-and-coming artists, and keeping close ties when everybody else stopped coming around. I wasn't trying to be something that I'm not. I didn't let money or fame make me paranoid to the point where I was scared to come to the hood. I didn't have a reason to have fear in my heart because I'm genuine. Only liars have fear because they scared somebody to catch on to their lies. The only reason I stopped dealing with a person was if they did something foul to me. And nobody from QB ever did nothing foul until then. Worm snatched my chain and then ran. I popped open my car's hood to get my gun out to shoot up that piece of shit Land Rover that he, fakey, spanked, mega, and ice were in. I looked over at Stobo and he already knew what I was thinking. The only thing that stopped me from punching holes in that Jeep was ice and core mega. If they wasn't in there... I'd probably be doing murder time right now. Fakie and Worm thought they were so gangster, but a real gangster nigga almost put an end to their careers petty crooks that night. I sat in the driver's seat with the gun on my lap, itching to show these wannabe thugs how I got down. But my better judgment caused me to pull off. I catch them soon enough. Godfather called later that night telling me that Fakie and Worm robbed Noid in Queensbridge and hit him in the head with a bottle. Somebody needs to kill one of these bummy-ass clowns. At home that night, when Kiki saw my swollen face and asked what happened, I broke down crying. And it was embarrassing telling her what happened. All the years I've been in QB, I never had problems with people because my hand didn't call for that. I wanted to murder one of these niggas for making me go home to my woman like that. The following morning, I called Fakey and told him to meet me in Queensbridge to get my chain back. Fakey said he got it from Worm and could meet me whenever I was ready. I called Hab to tell him what was going on. Don't go, Pete. Don't trust him. He kept telling me. You shouldn't go to QB no more. Man, listen, fuck all that, I said. I'm not scared of these bitch-ass niggas. I'm gonna get my chain back. Havoc was just looking out for my safety. But what he was telling me was the total opposite of how my pops raised me. When I got to the projects, I called Fakey, and he told me that he had to go to the studio with Nas, and we could meet by the hit factory in Manhattan. Mind you, I'm by myself. No army... No gang, no soldiers. Just me and my nine Ruger. Even if I wanted a gang, I didn't have anybody to turn to because my gang was telling me, don't do it, don't go. The only person who said they would roll with me was Jonathan Lighty, and I didn't even ask him to roll. When I got to the hit factory, Fakey and Cormega met me outside, and Fakey put my chain on my neck. It made me feel like a herb. Like he was doing me a favor or something. You okay? Mega asked. Yeah, I said. My eye was turning black from being punched in the nose. Fakie and Mega looked at me shaking their heads as if to feel sorry for me. Wanna come to the night session with us? Fakie asked. Fuck it, why not? I wanted to show them that I wasn't scared. So we walked into the session. I talked to Fakie and Nas about Worm. Fakie kept telling me that he didn't know Worm was going to do that. Blah, blah, blah. As long as Fakie gave me my chain back, it wasn't a problem for now. But Worm was definitely going to have to get dealt with ASAP. The next morning, Kiki and I decided to move into a hotel until we found a new crib. Loud Records paid for us to stay in a three-bedroom penthouse at the Flat Hotel in Manhattan, a luxury skyscraper on 52nd Street and Broadway, for two months. Murder Music went platinum within those two months, and we were on top of the world. After the lame setup that Fakie and Worm pulled at the tunnel, the very next Sunday, 
Worm was walking around the tunnel, and one of my boys from Hempstead cracked his face open with a Moet bottle. Worm didn't know who broke that bottle on his face or why. So just to tell people he had gotten revenge, the Sunday after that, Worm went back to the tunnel with a gun and opened fire on a random parked car. After shooting half his gun clip into the car, killing a young man in the driver's seat and wounding the others, Worm tried to run. But three undercover cops jumped out of a car right next to the car Worm shot up, yelling, Freeze! Drop the gun! Worm fired shots at the cops while running to his car, with the cops chasing and shooting at him. The cops shot up Worm's rod, riddling his body with bullets and almost killing him. Worm got 50 years to life. See, Pete? Twin told me. When people try to do foul shit, all we gotta do is sit back and wait. Because karma's gonna get our revenge for us. Ironically, the random young man who Worm killed that night just so happened to be the boyfriend of Kiki's homegirl.